Mommy Space, a place where you can remember who you are in the midst of it all. This podcast gives moms of all stages a voice to share their experiences and the truth that there is no right way to mom. Welcome back to Mommy Space. This is Bree, and today I am here with my cousin, Peggy Roloff. Welcome to the show. Oh, well, hi. <laughs> hi, cousin. Hi. Um, and actually, you are my my Nana's first cousin, correct? Yes. I Does that make us a second cousin? I think or, so. Or first cousin. Once oh, we're you know what? We would, be, we would be probably closer to a third cousin, but... Who cares? We're still cousins. Or first cousin, first cousin once removed. You think we're third? I, you know, I don't know. Matter. I actually don't know how it works. <laughs> I love but, you. We're related. Yes, yes. Um, I actually interviewed my Nana a couple weeks back, and she recommended that I reach out to you and talk to you. And I thought, of course, that would be so fun um, to kind of hear your story. And, and you speak to a lot of women and are – I'm passionate about that area, so I'm excited to share your story. So before we dive in, can you just share a little bit about yourself, where you're living, what family life looks like for you right now? Well, right now is different than it's been in the past. We were I was born and raised in San Francisco, right in the city, not outside, and uh, so was my husband. So we uh, started our family there. We were married there, but we moved to just the outskirts, and we lived in uh, different little towns around Concord and San Bruno and all. And then we uh, now live in Grass Valley, which is Northern California. It's beautiful. It's, mm. uh, you know, with lots of trees, but also lots of fires right now, but not right here. So we are loving this time of life. We've traveled a lot with missions, although we've never been supported as a missionary. We have been self-supporting missionaries and lived in Thailand for three months at a time. And we've been in Israel and different different places because we married young. So that gave us that opportunity later to travel without the baggage of little children. Now, that's my take on getting <laughs> having children. Yeah. So we yes. didn't do our traveling first. Yeah. Hey, I love that actually. That's actually quite encouraging. So for for those of us who who are wanting to travel but haven't yet or whatever, so I think that's great. Just hang on. Yeah, Just hang on. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I would love for you to kind of share your story of how you became a mom and uh, kind of the story of your journey into motherhood. What that looked like. Had you always wanted to be a mom? Um, and some of your emotional process before and after giving birth to your kids. Sounds good. Well, the, the the best thing is choosing the right man. And even though I was just 17 when we married, he was absolutely a cult, uh, not somebody you would pick out of a, a lineup of picture, I think. Mm. He's much more handsome now than he was then, although that <laughs> I wasn't looking for. I don't even know why in the world at 15 I was looking for somebody with character. But I look back and I saw that when I would go to church, my grandfather uh, and your great great grandfather was the minister at a church, and that's where my husband attended in San Francisco. And I just started noticing that he, all the old ladies and little children would come up to him. And I thought to myself, why I wasn't that clever at 15, but I evidently something within me, God's discernment, the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. said, that's something to pay attention to. Yeah, you know, I don't. I, I guess what I'm saying is, it doesn't matter the age. You've, if you've got, if you pray and ask the Holy Spirit for guidance, and don't let your um, attracts, your physical attractions, de mm. detour you. You'll be okay, because we both love the same God. We both had the same goal, and that was to be married. We have a commitment to our marriage, besides mm. to each other, but just to the fact mm. of being married, and that's mm. lost today, I think. Um, mm. Anyway, so. Um, We'd been married about a year and had our first child, and we had her born down in Los Angeles. As I said, we went to Santa Ana because Ron was stationed at um, LTA, which is lighter than air. It's a big blimp area oh, wow. down in uh, the Marine Corps down in Santa oh, wow. Ana. So that was exciting to me just to be in another place. But I was terribly homesick because I was a baby. But I would, didn't want to tell my mom that because then she'd say, see, I told you <laughs> so. So <clears throat> I never complained. I didn't and I think that's really good. I was very close to my mom before and also in later years. But during that first time, I didn't want her to know the problems, nor my friends, because they would say, I told you. And mm. I think that was healthy. I didn't have anybody mm. to whine to. And I didn't have close friends down there that I could say, oh, boy, did you know what happened? Because they'd say, you know what girlfriends would say? Oh, you shouldn't. Why? I wouldn't put up with that. 
you know, and that's the worst thing we can say to somebody. We need to say, no, you know, it will get better. Tomorrow will be a brighter day. Um, Mm -hmm. And it usually is. It was for me anyway. So anyway, that was, we had Ruthie born there. uh, Ruthie's our first. And then we, um, a year, 16 months later, I had a second child. We were back in San Francisco at that time. And our second child was born. And that was kind of a very interesting experience because Matthew had all kinds of birth problems. Um, he had his feet turned in like uh, they were club feet, they're called, and his arms were very short and his legs were very short. And I thought, oh, dear, what and what did we do wrong? You know, that's the first question, especially as Christians. And we were in a very legalistic uh, church at the time. And so you're sure that it's some unconfessed sin in your life. And we said, what have we done? And I said, well, I guess we need to get more involved. So we got more involved as teaching, you know, doing the, the nursery, teaching the Sunday school, and, and Ron did too. And, uh, you know, you just felt the cluck clucking of people. Although everyone was nice, but there's a lot of things that we perceive that aren't really true. Uh, I mean, even our Aunt Bonnie, uh, God rest her soul, she said, oh, well, there's nothing like this on our side of the family. She was oh, married yeah. in the family. So yeah. that kind of thing, you know, can just be so hurtful. But we knew we loved each other. We knew we loved God. And also we remember the scripture. And I'm sorry I don't have it yes. at my fingertips. That's so okay. You can look it up. Yeah. Is uh, where if you ask if you ask uh, your uh, if you ask for a fish, will he give you a um, serpent? If you ask for bread, will he give you a stone? No. And I had to hold on to that. I said, you know, that's right. This isn't a stone. This isn't a serpent. This is my baby. Mm. And God bless him. He's going to be, you know, OK. And uh, and he is today. He's he's doing very well. But you know you don't know that at the time. They're just this little baby with little twisted arms and legs, and it's like, oh dear Lord. So you know, take a deep breath. Well, uh, two and a half years later, uh, I'm pregnant again, and I have a, a third baby. And we know he's going to be okay because the doctors all said, oh, you never have that happen again. And it was Joshua. Now Joshua was a blue baby. He had severe heart problems. Well, again, we're saying, what is, I, we didn't smoke, we didn't chew, we didn't go with those that do, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. We didn't do yeah. any of the things that in the Christian faith that right. we like to say, oh, or right. evangelicals, you, uh, you did something wrong, at least in those days. So we held on tight and we knew, we named him Joshua because Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and we knew he was a, God loved him. And they said, don't name him. He won't go to the hospital, but he did. So we had Joshua home, and he was uh, a lot of um, anxious moments. Went to the hospital a lot that first and second and third year. Um, you know, like there was nine different times we had to run to the hospital in the first year. Wow. But anyway, he lived till wow. he was 34 because he was a fighter, and he outlived what the doctor's expectations were. Wow. And we miss wow. him dearly. But um, he was Joshua. And Matthew took – he said, Mom, don't worry about – where I am only, what, 21 or two years old, and Matthew says to me as this little guy, don't worry, Mom, I'll take care of Josh <laughs> if something happens oh. to us. Well, that was so sweet, but he was, I wasn't planning on going anywhere. <laughs> wow. So, uh, yeah, it was real sweet. So then our uh, we were not having any more children at all, but we had a doctor that liked to play tricks, and so he didn't put the, um, I think it was going to be an IUD, which I'm just as glad now, now I know more about IUD, but the pill made me very uh, emotional and up and down, and it was brand new at the time. So um, uh, I was pregnant with Sam, and Sam was just darling, but he also has the same problems that Matthew does. Wow. So I have two babies that are dwarfed, and they have diastrophic dwarfism, and then Joshua had this major um, multi-problemed um, heart. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, life went on. We kept trusting God and knowing that he would see things in, in his timing. And it's been true. Wow. So um, wow. that's the way I became a mom, besides the regular way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when you said, how'd you become a mom? Well, like everybody. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I need to rephrase that question. <laughs> yeah, right. I, well, I, I don't want all those one. details necessarily. <laughs> yeah. yeah, TMI. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so is there something else about that? That's just getting them here on the ground. Yeah, Um, I mean, just sharing your emotional process with having to care for children that have disabilities and kind of what was that process like for you, especially being in the church, being in a, um, you know, more legalistic environment? um, How did you process through that? How did you take care of your heart and and 
you know, protect that sacred family space in the midst of all of that, you know, change? Yeah, that's a really good question because it is a lot of change and it's a lot of heaviness in my heart, but also I I have to credit my husband as well as Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus is, I didn't know about the Holy Spirit. We were basically taught that the Holy Spirit wrote a book and went out of business. He, you know, it says he moved on the face of the uh, waters during creation, and also he was there at Pentecost. Other than that, you know, he came and left and did nothing about the indwelling Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have mm-hmm. uh, that as to rely on. But songs ministered to me a lot, and the one for, by um, Pafford, um, Spafford, the when sorrows like sea billows roll, you know, whatever my lot, I, that was taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That song would go through my mind because I had to remind myself and I had to continually hang on to that when others would say negative things or or where I felt like I was being judged or whatever. So I knew that God was in control and I had wonderful supportive parents, but they didn't know what to do either. Nobody knew what to say. And it's um, it's hard. You know, it's sometimes just better just to to be to, to practice the ministry of presence rather than mm-hmm. trying to say something. And so I had a couple of friends that were really dear. We never talked about the kids problems. We just did the regular things. And that's so helpful. Um, praying a lot. And then at uh, when Sam was just, um, in fact, it was just a few months before he was born, I started going to Bible study fellowship and learning about how the Lord worked our lives and about the Holy Spirit. Oh, my goodness. It was the most wonderful, absolutely exciting. But it took a lot to get me there because I didn't want to do something outside of where I was supposed to go. But because I did play it piano there. Um <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was just so exciting to know that we could be in the word and really you know seek the word ourselves seek the lord ourselves through the word and we i was in bsf 50 years and had miss johnson as a teaching leader and all so i just feel like the lord rewarded me in that way with such good bible teaching and a good foundation in the word so um it was a matter of a day-by-day process, Brianna. It's never easy. It's not easy with anything with the baby. In fact, the little things are what would usually send us off over the edge. We were in the hospital one time with Josh for um, seven weeks, and he had a brain abscess, and we had to have brain surgery. Uh-huh. Just on and on it went. It was it was an awful, awful time. And we had the other kids. Um, my mom and dad would come over to our house and watch them, and then we they'd bring them down. Anyway, I slept there. Ron would go to work and then sleep at the hospital all um all day and I was because he worked in the night and uh, it just it just was a lot of stress however we came home from the hospital yeah we came home from the hospital after seven weeks and we were had been buoyed up with prayer and by ourselves and by all of our friends and it was just a wonderful time we had Joshua home and the other kids were home and the sink stopped up and you'd have thought I mean talk about losing your salvation <laughs> you know, Ron had a stick and he's trying to undo the, the uh, garbage disposal and the sink is running. And then we started to laugh. We said, how can we let something like this so every day turn us into not trusting believers? So, you know, we've never put down anyone that ever has a, a step aside because life happens mm-hmm. and life is mm-hmm. full of problems. And um, I don't know. Do you ever listen to Jordan Peterson? No, do you I haven't. Oh, please turn him on. He's on oh, YouTube. Yeah. but. He's not a Christian, but he's a, uh, almost. He's a psychologist, and he says, life is tough. Mm. Life is tough. Mm. We just need to get over ourselves. And that's, that's really true. Word. And so the sooner yeah. we can accept that these things come into our life that we can't handle ourselves, yeah. and that we turn them over to, to God, and we can walk through difficult yeah. times together. So, so um, I think the closeness of a few friends, not a lot, but a few friends, a good Bible study, um, a lot of prayer and knowing that the Holy Spirit indwells us and then having a loving spouse and family. Mm-hmm. I don't know how people do that without God. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So would you kind of speak into then um, as your kids grew and even, I mean, I don't know how many people know uh, your son, Matthew, and his his wife and kids had a have a show called Little People Big World. So um, what was that like, like transitioning into their older years and, um, and then becoming a grandma? Like, how how did that all feel for you um, in those transitions? That is a good question, because the transition is the big word. Yeah, you're here with four, four little kids at home and intense. And then then the empty nest, 
But um, mm-hmm. Matthew, uh, Ruthie, our daughter, Mary, she became a nurse, and she, which was a wonderful treat for us because I thought once she got into college, she went to Westmont, and then she came home after a year, and she said, you know what? I think I want to be a nurse. And I thought, you do? After being in the hospital from the time she was nine months old, watching her brothers and being with surgery, and I thought she'd want to go so far away. She goes, well, who better could minister to people? So that was a very much of an encouragement word for us. She's uh, married now. Uh, her husband happens to be a doctor, and, and they have three children, and she's expecting her first grandbaby. Oh, so, congratulations. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That'll be our third grade. So we're really excited about that. So that's Ruthie. And then um, uh, Matthew, uh, growing up, you know, there was all those things that you can start to worry about. And I had some parents, we belong to Little People of America, which is a great organization when you have a dwarf child, because you realize you're not alone. Mm-hmm. There's usually about a thousand mm-hmm. people at, a, at an annual conference, uh, their convention. I think I think it just ended. It's over the 4th, uh, July 4th, we're somewhere in the United States. But um, so we would go there. But um, I... Uh, there would be pe- sometimes people that I would meet there that I got to know, and they would say, well, don't let anybody do this. If you, they're staring at you, child, you tell them this, and you do that. And I thought, that's not the way I work with life. I'd rather win people than I would to put them off. So I never did any of that kind of thing. I just uh, let people, if they wanted to stare, that was their prerogative. And my husband, this is where he came in so handy. He would say, well, Matthew, if they're staring, that means they're interested. Because he came home one time, yeah. he said, "It just means they're interested. Let them look. That's great, and uh, and they'll be learning mm-hmm. something." Well, sure enough, Matthew was probably about four or five, and because he was so little, being dwarfed, uh, people would come up to him at the grocery store. I didn't know this at the time. I've heard this later, and and would say, um, "Oh, how how old are you?" He says, "Well, I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm two. I'm a genius, you know." <laughs> <Stuff like that. laughs> really five but he always was could talk himself out of anything and if people would come by and they grab their child's arm like don't stare he'd say oh listen i'd like to talk to him just that's okay and he would talk to people and tell them what was on because they want to know how come you've got this how come you're wearing crutches how come you you have braces on your legs and he would love to tell them wow. and that's the reason he wow. could, i'm going somewhere with this yeah. no no that's great that's why he got into the show is that he said to amy one day they, they approached him. He's never gone sought that kind of thing. He's just been a media magnet all his life. But um, he went to Amy and he said, you know, this uh, Discovery Channel wants to do a program about our family. And she said, well, I don't want that. She said, I don't want to be out, out in the public. And, and he understood that. But he said, you know, think of how much you were stared at as a kid. Wouldn't it be good if we could give a venue for people to sit at home and to stare? And what he heard the first year or so is even college kids would gather around in the in the uh, what do you call the room, the lounges, and watch the show and laugh and and do whatever. He didn't care. It wasn't affecting them. But what they started out laughing at, they began saying other things. You know, like they would, um, they knew they'd moved. I forgot what it was now. I think it was um, that people would write and say, oh, how pitiful, how sorry. And then they started saying, how come Amy's not keeping her house? How come you're so bossy? And those, <laughs> he knew they had moved away from the disability onto the, we're just people that live the same as everyone. So, um, so it really worked out well. And it, we have met so many people. We used to work at Matthew's farm for about 10 years. We would be, uh, the, I was the deputy and Ron was the sheriff at the old town, the old Western town. And people would come out there just wanting to meet us and meet Matt and them. And they would tell most stories about how the show had helped them. People who had dwarf babies, there were people who had been wounded in Vietnam, uh, people who had uh, cerebral palsy, whatever. They all related to the story of somebody having difficulties and being able to overcome. So it's been a real wow. godsend. And he spoke at a lot of um, uh, a lot of churches, a lot of conferences. Um, what's the name of the, the Christian book? I don't know if, if family bookstores are still in business or not, but yeah. he did their annual yeah. conference one uh, week. So he's, you know, he's preached, he's just done a lot of things. Um, wow. He still does inspirational speaking. But, um, anyway, that's Matthew. Josh was a different soul. He was just a sweet soul, very uh, quiet, but uh, very observant and very loving. And he, when he passed uh, at 34, our little church here, there were like over 650 people there. It was like, where'd they come from? So we asked, we passed out nine, three by five cards real quickly. And the comments were just marvelous. How good Josh was to them. One lady told about being on the street corner in downtown Grass Valley and feeling so lost. And she said, Josh came up beside me. I have a hard time believing it because he was so quiet. And he said, um, ask her some questions. And he told her uh, that he loved living there. And 
just, she said, just is so encouraged me and invited her to come to church. And then somebody from church says, I've always stood in the back. And he said, one day Josh asked me to come and sit with him and how wonderful that was. Just that kind of story. Everyone has a ministry of some sort. So um, he was well loved by us and by others. And then Sam came along and he's, he's a whole different person. He's the opposite of Matthew. Darling, big brown eyes. And he had blonde hair at the time. Now he's gray. They both are. I don't know where they get that. <laughs> So uh, anyway, he's an artist, and he went to the San Francisco Art Institute. He's a very uh, he's a successful artist, which artists aren't always oh. successful. Uh, so he has three children, <clears throat> all of them average size. In fact, we use the word average because there's an average height, and there's a short stature or overly tall. Mm-hmm. We don't say um, normal. Let's say, oh, they're normal. Yeah, well, yeah. what's normal? Yeah, totally. That's there's, so good. Yeah. 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 So which norm are you using? Yeah. So instead, if you lived in a pygmy village, you'd be normal, <laughs> totally. but it's just how average or how average my height is. So that was uh, real good. And then little people came along. They could use, cause little people of America, the uh, club, they like to use that word rather than uh, midget. Midget is a, a type of, of uh, dwarf. It's a miniature person like, uh, like Tom Thumb was uh, tiny all over. And um, and the achondroplasia, like Amy and Zach, their son Zach, Mm -hmm. is uh, achondroplasia. And that's a different kind than Matthew and Sam, who have diastrophic dwarfism. There are like 120 or more varieties of dwarfs. So, or people, people with dwarfism. I just slipped up on my own political correctness. Instead of saying dwarfs, I like to say, uh, you know, people with dwarfism. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. So now we have Matthew married. And then he has, uh, Amy uh, had a hard time getting pregnant, but she did. And she carried him to term, and they were twins. Uh, Jeremy is tall, average size, and uh, Zach is dwarfed like his mom. Not they didn't get, Nobody got that recessive gene that Matt has. Matt and Sam is recessive, which means that Ron and I, somewhere along the line, that gene crossed up. But we've taken all kinds of tests and sent them to Finland and wherever they're doing testing, and you know nobody knows. Yeah. So um, we just yeah. love them, and that's just the way it is. So Sam, I mean, Matthew had uh, Jeremy and Zachary, and then two years later they had Molly, who's average height, and she now is married and a very bright, beautiful girl. And then their baby is Jacob, and he's uh, he's an artist and a writer, and he's an interesting character. We just love him to death. And everybody was here last weekend for my husband's birthday, so that was really nice. So cool. And then is that their baby? Yes, and then Sam has – three average size kids, uh, real tall, in fact. So oh. his three, Max, Henry. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, that's oh. kind of where we're going. And so it's, I love it when we can be with them. I mean, empty nest is one thing, but getting to see them again and getting for you to be contact with your Nana, I know means a lot. Cause it does to me if my kids just a call or a note or, mm. you know, a text, even. I get excited. And that's where Tori is so good. Tori is Zach's wife. She's just so good to text every once in a while. And I just love it. That is so cool. Yeah. So how was it becoming um, a grandmother and now great grandmother? Like what, what's that like? Just speak a little bit into that. Well, it was exciting because as a mom, you're, you're, you're ready to have them grow up, but then you're really not ready to let them go Mm. because it's like, we're, what's going to happen. So our daughter married first and uh, she went uh, to Florida right away and then they went to Okinawa. So I really missed her, missed her terribly. But uh, she's back here living in Grass Valley now. So we're uh, close. And and then just uh, this month, her three daughters have all come back from where their places around the world. Um, they're just below 30 and thir- one's 31. And the others are 29 or 28 or 9. They're twins. We have twins in the family. Ron's wow. a twin and Zach okay. and Jeremy are twins. And then uh, Hannah and Sarah so Sarah is married and they went and she and her husband went and lived in Finland for five years and then came back and lived in Vermont and her twin has been living in Washington DC for like seven years or so and Rachel the oldest one lived there first and uh and then she went to um Rachel went to Columbia in New York City and got her master's in social work so she's a social worker came back here and worked in San Francisco area for a couple of years with a special school and then they all decided to move here because Sarah was pregnant and these sisters are not going to let her have that niece of there or nephew without them. Yeah. So it's really fun. So I, yeah. we're, we're getting to benefit. Uh, we're getting the girls here and the great grandbaby. Uh, so anyway, life goes on. It's wonderful. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. 
I think I'd like to ask if you have, um, I mean, you've already given advice in regards to if you are a mother um, experiencing raising a child with disability, some advice on kind of how to protect your heart and your family within that space. Um, But is there anything, uh, any other advice you would give to just moms in general? Like, um, I feel like you've given a ton already, but just, just something to kind of close us out like that you wish you would have known or whatever, even to grandmas. Like, yeah, I do know this. I have observed this as old as I am. I've observed this for a lot of years and that's with your own child, with your grandchild and with the great grand, but mainly in this children, when your babies is to not make them the center of your universe. I see that so often, especially if they have a disability, people just go right to them or even a mom with a average child, you know, that's healthy. They just make the child the center of the world. That's not good for the child. And it's not good for you or your relationship with your husband. Many divorces happen because the mother is so caught up with that baby. Like she created that God created that baby. You have to carry it for him and delivered it. And it's here now for the world, but you need to love your husband and the best, I heard this years ago. The best gift you can give to your children is to love their dad or mom. So good. So I think that's that would be my biggest advice, to not center your life around that child. That's perfect. I love that advice. Oh, thank you so much for that. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to share your story and give some, I think, much needed advice to this little community. I so appreciate it. Well, I'm thrilled with your ministry. You're doing a wonderful Aww. job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. Please share this with a friend if it impacted you in any way and leave a review on iTunes so other mamas can hear the truth that they are enough and they are doing their very best. Be sure to catch up on what's happening in the Mommy Space community every day on Instagram at Mommy Space. And you can email me at mommyspace at gmail.com for questions or interview recommendations. All my love to you, Mama. You're amazing. See you next week. Just to say that I'm the one you love. It's so like you to do the best for one, the best for love. It's so like